I got the book of Romans in my heart tonight. Is that okay? Uh, little thought about Romans. I mean, you got to, I think Paul wrote Romans. He was probably born again and traveling and preaching and ministering and writing. And I think he wrote Romans about 20, 21 years after he was saved. So he had a lot of Christian experience, a lot of God experience. I, I feel like when he writes Romans, I think it's a perfect time. It's like he's not writing in the zeal of what he's learning. He's writing in the maturity or the truth of what he's lived, what he's walked and what he's seen. And uh, I don't know about you, but I like consistency in God. I, I think if we can live consistent, we'll affect people. If we can have consistency and stay steadfast. Not up and down and hot one moment and just kind of mellow for a while. And then we're on fire again. And then it's like we're hanging in there. Consistency. Consistency is a big deal in your relationships, your family. Consistency is important. And, and, and when you look at Paul's life, <laughs> he was, sorry, didn't mean to joke about this, but he was consistently persecuted. <laughs> because he was consistently preaching the same thing all those years and didn't change his mind I don't know about you but I like that I, I, I mean Paul was getting beat for something that gets criticized in today's church in a huge way I don't think we realize what we're doing and we're, most of us that are doing it are saying we're Christian Paul was getting beat and persecuted for saying that a man can be saved by grace. That God just saves a man through the finished work of Jesus. Because that man believes. Yep. And Paul would get whipped for that. Because you had to earn something. You had to do something. You had to be a better person. You had to prove something. And Paul was continually preaching that a man could just be saved by simple faith in the finished work of the Son of God. And that that work was enough to wash a man clean if his heart believed. Now, here's the beautiful thing. See, that, that people persecute the message. I, I believe this, Pastor. They persecute the message because they don't really understand it. The goodness of God is designed to lead you to repentance. When you see that God sees you through His Son as if you've never sinned, justifies you, makes you clean, empowers you to stand before Him as if you've always been a son or daughter in His sight. Paul would preach that in a, in a, a, a Judaism culture, in a culture that, was, that you were saved by works, that, that you were saved, well, you couldn't even be saved through the law because you're missing the law. So you're really judged by the law. But men used that as a standard, so they were looking at people, and, they, and, 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 and then when Paul came and preached this message, they're like, ah, blasphemy, heresy. We find the same thing today when people talk on righteousness, they talk on grace. And I understand some people go to extremes and, and they teach grace in a way that God never intended. But that doesn't mean you swing the pendulum over here and cut off the message. You just got to make it clear. I feel like we got to look at something tonight. See, the theme in Romans is righteousness. You can't get around it. Like, like if, if you want to bless yourself and, and touch your heart in God in a, in a neat way sometime, just take time, talk to the Holy Spirit and ask Him to bring you revelation and get along with God. Just get along with God and just read Romans 1 and just go the whole way through. No, I mean like just go the whole way through. And it's just, it'll just build and grow. It's incredible. Uh, people... Pull out Romans 7 and teach that Paul was that man when he's writing and that was his struggles. If you just would read 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and go through, you can't make that mistake. Like, I don't even know what Bible people are reading sometimes. I'm like, please, Lord. Like, how do people come up with some of this stuff? <laughs> I mean, he even starts the chapter in 7 off saying, though, I'm writing to those of you who know the law. And that unless you, something dies, you can't move on to something else. So something has to die. And he's saying the man he was under the law, but that died, and now he's going to move on to something else. Yeah? But you can't, you look at five, six, seven, and eight in, in, in concession. Just do yourself a favor, because I can't do it tonight, but I'm having a hard time getting started in one. But 
Start in one and go through and just bless your heart in the Lord. I mean it. Like get alone when nobody's looking. Just ask Holy Spirit to just teach you. See, it's the goodness of God. People get condemned. People feel guilty. People feel ashamed. They don't understand that they, the only reason they can feel those ways is because there's something still alive inside. There's something good. There's something workable and pliable. If you were, if, if a condemned person was what they really believe they are, they wouldn't even care to be condemned. This is stuff we don't understand. You can't condemn a person that's that bad, that doesn't care, that says whatever. The only thing condemnation is trying to pervertedly rest on is the fact that they're alive inside. And they got something to work with. It just gets misguided and misconstrued. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, to change. I don't know about you, but that Jesus would come. I know me before Jesus. You know you before Jesus. Some people think they know you before Jesus. But you know you before Jesus. (laughs) And then Jesus comes, does what he does. And at some point in our lives, we find out this message. So important to hear it clear and hear it right. Like, See, if you were the enemy, you would taint the message. You would try to take the power of it out of it. You'd just make it about someday, off in the future, because then people would lose their focus. Try to make it just about heaven or hell or where you're going when you die. And then you'd lose your focus. Because that doesn't even persuade me to change If you're telling me I just need to believe something to change my destination, that's pretty easy then. I'll just say, okay, I'll believe this. But the gospel is way more intimate and life-changing than that. It's, It's not about you changing your destination. It's about your whole life being transformed. It's about the why behind your life, your perspectives, your motives. It's about everything that makes you tick and everything about you being totally changed. Where one day you were living, you were self Self-oriented, self-driven, self-conscious, self-inspired, if you will. You were just, it was about you. Come on, I know in my life, the good I did, I did a lot of good in my life, young and early on, and it made me feel good when my doing good made somebody say something good about me. That my doing good made me feel good. So was I doing good to really do good, or was I doing good to feel good? That's why we get hurt and disappointed and let down. Well, nobody appreciates me. Well, if you're doing your good for the right reasons, you don't need all that kickback. We shouldn't have frustrated, discouraged people if if your good is in the right way. But here's God. I'm all that. I'm, I'm, I'm mixed up like you were. I don't know who was more mixed up. I just think we were all really mixed up. (laughs) But I was really mixed up. So were you. Because we were self-centered. We were self-focused. It's amazing. The Bible says, unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. How true is that? If you live your whole life from beginning to end and all you ever pursued is things that benefited yourself. Even if you good, did good deeds, but if yourself was still in, hidden in the intention, then you never had anything to multiply. You just catered to yourself. That's why it abides alone. That seed abides alone unless it dies and falls to the ground. So when it dies, it has to die to its motive. Like that's what dying means. The seed dies. So you and I die. What do we die to? Do we just die to sin? Do we just die to the old works? Well, no, because without God's grace, you're never going to change that anyway. No, you die to motives. You die to a reason for being. You you die to the thing that made you tick. Can I talk real plain? You died to the why. That thing that drove you and me that we had in us from the time we can remember. Like you didn't get trained 
to feel that way. You just were born that way. You were born in Adam and by sheer instinct and by nature you were self-centered because of God and man were separated. You were born into that. Nobody had to teach you to go, no, me, mine, eh, ah. <laughs> Nobody had to teach you that. You didn't stay up late to master that. You didn't crash the books. You just got an A. <laughs> That's a 4.0. You mastered a 4.0. <laughs> yeah. Self, no, but you didn't have to work to be jealous. You didn't have to work to be proud. You didn't have to work to be hurt, angry, frustrated, or offended. They were all natural traits that all of us possessed from the time we can remember. And the trap is we call them normal. None of them normal. They're all perverted. And none of them produce life. There is a giveaway. You look at the fruit that a thing's producing, you'll know where its origin is. You don't need a long alibi to justify a trait that's not producing life. Kill it. You don't need a well, yeah, but, well, you know I'm only this way because. You don't need a long alibi to cause something to survive that never was supposed to live. Are you with me? trying to read Romans. <laughs> no, it's just right. See, we were all this way. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's, there's nobody perfect, obviously, in the sight of God, but it was worse than that. We were all self-centered. I mean, even the things we did had self-centered intention. Most relationships were built on the need, not the love. That's why they fall apart. That's why they're rocky, shaky. That's why they're high and low. That's why you can have four children together and now you can't stand that person. No condemnation in what I'm saying. There's just truth in it. Don't, don't be hurt by it. I'm just saying. Here's God the whole time we're living. Some of us get glimmers of truth. Some of us had some things we actually saw along the way, but we still didn't follow through with it. Some of us knew to do right and still didn't do right. We've got those moments. But here's God the whole time, who he is, looking at us, knowing we're more, knowing we can be more, knowing if he lives on the inside of us, what we'll look like, knowing we can be changed, knowing that we don't know who we are. Jesus says, forgive them, Father. They don't know what to do. I'm reading my Bible. I'm thinking they knew what they were doing. It's what it looks like. But Jesus knows more than me. And he says, no, if they really knew who they were, if they really knew who I was, if they really knew, they wouldn't have been doing what they're doing. But when you look, it looks like they knew. I mean, it even said some of them believed, but they didn't want to let people know they believed because they didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. They didn't want to be mocked, made fun of they didn't. It seemed like they knew what they were doing. They had this meeting behind the scenes. Judas was there. They're buying him out. And it just seemed like they knew, but Jesus said, nope, they don't know. I mean, that's amazing, guys, that Jesus is as pure as pure can be, as perfect as perfect can be. He loved like as perfect as love can love, and there he hangs, and the best love and purity and perfect can say, is forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I want that revelation in my life. I don't know about you. I don't want him to just forgive me of sin. I want that revelation in my life. I want to see you like he does. Like, like I don't want to love my own life at all. I don't want to need anything from you. I just want to see you for what you're created to be. And then I'll do that truth justice. Like, I, like how... Jesus is hanging there and he's perfect, Pastor. And he's beaten and he's mocked and he's ridiculed and he just takes blow after blow after blow after blow because he knows they don't know who they are. That's what empowered him. That's what, that's what love, love knew they don't know. Not how can you do this to me? Who do you think you are? 
He lets it out on the cross. Forgive them. They don't know. They're blind. They don't know who they are. So he said, we know who they are. That's why he said early in his ministry, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I believe he was talking about the love. I believe he was talking about the righteous judgment. I believe he was talking about the mercy that triumphs over judgment. See, we're not gleaning this part from Jesus, so we want the blessing of the Lord instead of the heart of the Lord. So we still staying angry, and I can't believe you. Well, you should have never. Well, how come you? Well, I didn't, and you wouldn't. That's got to all go when you go die to yourself. When you die to yourself, all that's got to go. Because I've never seen a produced life. Did you ever see a produced life? Did you ever see the need to, to, to be right produced life? You know what's worse? When we are right. Boy, that'll produce some unrighteousness. <laughs> when you have a need to be right and you actually are right, <laughs> that could get ugly. Because <laughs> then the only thing anybody else says is wrong because you're right. And now your actions are justified, your attitude's justified, your expression's justified, just because you're right. Jesus was right every day. Oh my God. Every day. He's never not right. And he never had a need to point out what was wrong. He just showed the love. He said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, you think... Because of what we were trained by and the way I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, that's deep. That's profound. Forgive them. They know not. Come on, if we're hanging there, we got different. We got something else to say. We're like, are you kidding me? I've raised the dead. Barabbas, you killed him? You, you, or he killed a man and you let him go. You did this to me. I raised the dead. He's in for murder. You're letting him go killing me? You people are crazy. He's got conspiracy on his record. I'm trying to pursue peace. I've hurt no one. I've multiplied your food. I've healed your sick. I've cast out devils. I've cleansed your lepers. And you want to turn on me. And I've done good for all these years. Come on, guys. We would have a beef. In fact, I'm the son of God and nothing was made that wasn't made through me and you don't even know who I am? Are you kidding me? If you don't know by now, how will you ever know I'm done with all of you? No, he didn't do none of that. Come on, you just think about what we would have said and how different what he brought was than who we were. What he brought was so different than who we were. And that's the point to born again. Salvation. New creation reality. Transformation. New life through Christ. You name it. Any phrase you throw out there like that. That's what's so different. He brought something brand new. Amen. Taking away the old. And giving the new. Hallelujah. Are you with me? I need you to look at Romans chapter 1. I need you to look at Romans chapter 1 with me. We're going to scroll here and I want you to see something. The reason I think we just went into that 15 minute whatever we just did. Through one sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And through his blood and his resurrection. If you'll come humbly through faith. Knowing that God's saying you're more than what you've lived. Forgive them Father they know not what they're doing. They've been deceived. They've been born into Adam. They've been blind. They've believed the lie. But I'm the truth. And I'm going to make them see. Better than that, I'm going to make them free. So he says, come unto me. I'll give you rest. So this is, this is the gospel. This thing isn't just about you getting a blessing. It's and getting something from him to bless your life and protect your life and provide for your life. This is about seeing the heart of God and who God is and understanding what love really looks like. Because if we were created for his image, we better behold him. If we're going to put on Christ, we better know what he looks like. Yeah? Come on. 
You're not just putting on the theology of Christ. You're putting on the person of Christ. The Spirit of God lives in us. Do you get it? That's intense, guys. So I want you to understand this. When Paul's preaching this, this was totally out of the box. Like, this is what he got beat for. What he's writing is what he got beat for again and again and again. And the beatings didn't make him change his mind, didn't take words out of his mouth, didn't shut him up. That's impressive. I mean, this guy knows it. He, he, we don't know, we know he held the clothes of the men that stoned Stephen. We don't know how many men Paul actually killed. We know he had uh, 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 papers to arrest people. He was dragging Christians to jail. He was a major persecutor of men. We do know that. We know he didn't do some very good things. And he knows, watch, he knows that God sees him as if he didn't do any of those things. Yet he knows he did. And yet God sees him as if he never did. Now he gets that. He's excited because that's transforming. Yeah? And then he's writing about it and getting pummeled for it. And they're saying it can't be that way. But it's the way. But it can't be that way. Has to be more. That's what people are thinking. This is too simple. Why? Because nobody knows what love is. Everybody knows what works is. And he said, she said, and, and, and earn what you got. And, and our whole lives growing up, we very rarely got encouraged and complimented when we did right because we're expected to do right. We got focused on when we did wrong. And there's this... Uh, do you realize if all you do is focus on when somebody does wrong, that sooner or later all they believe is they're a mess up and all they do is wrong, and you eventually, well, you might have already just seen them that way. If all you're doing is noticing the wrong, then that's how you see them. Wonder if God came and all he did was point out the wrong in our lives. Here's what Jesus does. He comes, he raises from the dead, and Holy Spirit's wooing us. And here's what the simple gospel sounds like if you just paraphrase all this truth right here. He's like, he's like running to you and saying, hey man, I know who I created you to be and I know who I intended you to be. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, it's all good. I've watched it all the way. So just come unto me. Let me live in you. We can be one. And let me shine through your life and let me realign why you're here, man. Because I've known you from the beginning. You're on purpose and you're my idea. I love you. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? Yeah, that's what the gospel's saying. It's exactly what the gospel's saying. For some reason, people have a hard time receiving it. And the greatest thing you can do is receive it. If you don't receive it fully, you'll still have a mixed up identity. You'll, some people justify not receiving it. Well, I know he forgave me of everything, but I still... No, no, you got to just come on in. And you just come on in and you believe. That he forgave you and that you're clean and that you're free. I pastored full time for about eight and a half years. I've counseled, talked to, and been on a personal level with who knows how many people. A few. It's rare. Very small percentage rare. To find somebody in my whole pastoral life. That just woke up in the morning and knew they were clean. Just woke up in the morning and thanked God for loving them. Just woke up in the morning and knew they were accepted in the beloved and they were righteous in the sight of God. Very rare, small percentage rare that a Christian would just say, thank you for loving me, Father. Just a mother in the kitchen, just making breakfast, kids ready to come to school instead of being overwhelmed and rushed and I got to get to work yet and I got like four jobs in a sense and you know, instead of any of that, just the grace of God. Just And I understand details in life and stuff. Not being condemning at all. I'm just saying, man, if you'll live here, everything else will start making sense. Yeah? 
You sit in the kitchen. Nobody's even in there yet. Just thanks for loving me. I just so appreciate you. See, because when you receive his love and you start seeing yourself the way he sees you, let me tell you what that begins to do to your eyes. That starts making you realize he sees everybody that way. And then the way you see people changes. And all of a sudden, you start seeing what he sees. And you start seeing what's always been there, whether it's there or not. Did you get it? Because forgive them, they, it's pretty profound. What's Jesus saying when he says that? They can be a whole lot more than they are if they see. Yeah? And if they see, everything will change. Paul's writing to the Romans. He's praying that someday he gets to go there and be with them and see them. He thanks God for them. He says their faith is spoken about throughout the world. That's pretty intense in verse 8. And he doesn't pray, cease praying. I mean, he doesn't pray uh, periodically. He says, I pray without ceasing. And I continue to make mention of you in my prayers always. And he's longed to see them. In verse 12, 13, he's just writing to them. It's very hearty. It's very personal. And he wants them encouraged and them to be encouraged together, him and them. And he's just going on. And then he says, as, as, so in verse 15, so as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So he wanted to come and just pour out his heart. And then in verse 16, he says this thing that we put on our refrigerators because it's amazing. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's not saying I don't have any fear of man. I'm not ashamed of the God. I'm not ashamed to say I'm a believer. I'm not ashamed to say I'm a Christian. What he's saying is I'm not ashamed of the root of the message. I'm not ashamed of what I'm preaching to you and the power of it and the strength of it. He's not like just say, hey, I'm not ashamed to get a bullhorn and let you know I go to New Beginnings and stand on a street corner with a New Beginnings shirt. He's not, it's, 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 it's not saying that. Are you with me? Look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for in it the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in it this is salvation is there. And, and for first the Jews and then the Greeks. Now look what he's saying. For in the gospel, in it, meaning the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What's he saying? I'm not ashamed to stand here and tell you that I believe I've been made right through the act of Jesus Christ without doing a thing but believing that. Come on. That's huge. That's powerful. The devil hates it and religion hates it. Come yeah. <laughs> on. Because religion is man's attempt to get a hold of God. That's just when we say religion, you, religion, religion isn't what we're going to do when we gather tomorrow, hopefully on Sunday. Religion is man's attempt to get a hold of God. Christianity is God getting a hold of man. Wow. It's totally backwards. It's totally different. Religion says you have to work your way to Him. Christianity, faith through Jesus says God brought you to Him. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. He did the work. We're not indebted to the Lord. Paul writes about it in Romans. He says if, if you're indebted. Then it's not grace. And if it's grace. Then there's no debt. Are you with me? Look this is vital. Don't think this is some. Like just a theological thing. This is vital. Paul said. I'm not ashamed of this gospel for in this good news, the right standing you have with God through the finished work of Christ is revealed from faith to faith. So I'm thinking 21 years later, Paul knows what he's writing. Paul was knocked off the horse 21 years before, about 35 AD. He wrote this about 56 AD. Just a little history. So 21 years, 
later after getting knocked off the horse, he's saying this righteousness that's in the gospel is revealed from faith to faith. And it's the power of God in the gospel, the power of it, like the, the glue, the, the power of this message is that God sees you right. Why is that so important? Because when you know you haven't been right, and he says, hey, you just haven't known who you are. You haven't really known me. You have no idea who you are. You were born into Adam. I want you born again. I want to pull you out of darkness. I want to place you in the light. Translate you into the kingdom of the son of my love. I want to put my spirit in you. I want to put my love in you. I want to put my nature in you. Look, irregardless, no matter where you've been, what you've done, what's been done to you, you have no idea who you are, and you think that story is you. But this story is you and I want to put it on you so I want you to put off the old and I want you to put on the new yeah it's born again born again as if you never lived before born again are you with me so this gospel he's not ashamed of it For in this gospel, the power of God is revealed. This power for God to save, salvation, soteria. It's actually healed, deliver, protect, preserve, made whole, to keep safe and sound. So this preserving, saving, delivering, healing, restoring power of God is in this message. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. The power of God to save is in it because in this message, God makes you right with him. That's what he's saying. You've got to get that. I've got to get that. Are you following me? They got it up there? No? Yeah? I've seen you all looking up there. I thought thought it was up there. I I thought, you all looking up there. Look, you even have it capitalized. (laughs) For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The righteous man, he shall live by what? So what's he saying? This is how simple it is. That's why you have to become like a little child. See, it's not long into childhood where you become aware of yourself. A real little child is clueless to themselves. They, they're innocent. They'll do something they shouldn't be doing. Parent will gasp, and they don't even know. The kid, the child. The child will run up. The child will run up. And I, I remember when I was pastor, the child, child would run up and hug my leg while I'm in the middle of preaching. Who knows? That's beautiful and awesome. But the parents are like, oh, you should be up there. And I'm like, sure, you should be. Pick them up. Keep preaching. But, but they can go to a conference. You could be in a conference. There'd be 2,000 people there. And something's going on. And a little child will wander up and be looking at the amps and looking at the plugs. And wanting to climb up and get up there on the platform. Clueless that there's 2,000 people looking. (laughs) But it ain't long down the road where they become aware. Where they would be too self-conscious to do that. So the Lord says, unless you become like a little child. He says that on purpose. Because there's a line... And it's not too far in where they become aware of themselves, and then you lose innocence. When you're not aware of yourself, you have an amazing innocence. Because you can't have self as your motive. It's just so innocent. Are you with me? So when you become self-conscious, you lose innocence. When you become a little child, he's talking about the restoration of innocence where your motive is pure, and the pure in heart shall see God. And to the pure, all things are pure. Yeah? So he's actually encouraging us, Pastor, saying, yes, you can have a pure heart. You can have a pure motive. The why behind your life can be love, and you can be innocent as a little child who's not self-conscious. And what you do, you really can do for the glory of God. And what you do, you really can do for the sake of another. Without anything in return, you can just lay down your life, because greater love hath no man than this. You see why scripture says what it says? Now, isn't that what Jesus did? It's incredible. And then, 
He, he's like our model. He's like, he's our savior. Yes, he, we call him, people call him our sin substitute. He's, he's like so much more like he's the revelation of the father. He's the revelation of what we're called to be because he said, follow me. So we're supposed to look like the father. And if we're not careful in this country, we just turn him into the blesser. The meter of my needs, my provision, hopefully. The one that protects everything I care for. And that sets you up to be disappointed in him, discouraged by him, judge him, and be angry at him. I've seen people legitimately in their emotions through wrong belief mad at him. Wrong believing. And all he's done is try to take all the wrong off of us by making us right in his sight through one act, the cross of Jesus Christ. He's just saying, would you come and just believe? Would you believe you're more than what you've ever understood? Would you believe that your life can be different? Would you believe that I created you with a different intention than you were born into? Would you believe? Would you come out of Adam? Would you come into me? Would you believe? I'll forgive everything you've ever done, and I'll put my spirit in you, my life in you, my love in you, my nature in you. See, it's the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation for them that believe for in it the rightness that we have with God, the right standing that we have with God is revealed. Righteousness has two uses in the New Testament. You'll find two definitions. There's righteousness and then there's the work of righteousness. It's the same word, but it has a little different. The righteousness here is your ability to stand before God and be accepted and received through Christ as if you've never sinned, justified, in His sight, totally vindicated, totally clean, pure, without spot, without blemish, That's amazing. Colossians says, holy, blameless, and above reproach. What would happen if we believers start believing that? What would happen every day if you wake up and you don't try to live blameless, you believe you are blameless? See, a lot of people don't understand the power of that. The power of that is as a man thinketh, so he is. See, if you're trying to live blameless, you're, you're conscious of you and your actions and you'll be judgmental to yourself. You'll take tests at the end of the day that God never even put on your desk. You'll grade your score and your score will be your identity. And the tricky part is people that care are the ones that do that, not the ones that don't care. People that care live, do that because they care. So they get tricked into it through their care. Satan perverts their... Some of the purest people I've ever met that love Jesus the most that I've ever seen, that truly love him, live with an inner secret condemnation because they feel like they're failing him and they're not living up to their desire to love him. That's what I've learned. And Satan's taking advantage of a heart that's alive, trying to crush it so it never becomes what he paid for. Are you with me? It's a really big deal. So righteousness, the ability given by God to stand in his sight, holy, blameless, and above reproach, without any sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame, as if you've never done wrong, as if you've always been right with him. (laughs) And as a man thinketh, so he is. Make a tree good, the fruit will be good. So how's our life change? By discipline. Discipline has its places in our life. Discipline isn't what transforms your life. This gospel, the good news, it's the power of God unto salvation. You could actually say unto transformation and not do that word injustice. Where does it come from? Righteousness. What word gets probably fought the most in Christendom? Righteousness. Well, you can't teach people that because then they'll just go and they'll just sin and get away with it and they'll just think, hey, God loves me anyway. That's just the last thing we're preaching. If, if somebody's doing that, they're not even seeing what I'm saying. Paul talks about in the end of Romans 1. It's, it's just, but, but he's going to come and see me as if I've never sinned, even though I know I have, and say, through this thing he said, forgive them, they don't know what they do, and 
and say, look, you were blind. You had no idea who you were. You were born into Adam. You were separate from me. But man, I've come. I paid the price for you to be joined to me. Look, nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. Now I'm back to the Father. The Father's back to me. Yay. He puts his life in me. He wipes me clean. He takes away my past. He gives me a present and things to come. You get it? So I have nothing back here. Everything's new. I have present and things to come. How many people spend years in regret, remorse, looking back? I've seen Christians years later still talking about years ago. The bad and the ugly. Regrets, regrets. Come on, it's the world's way. Regret. It's the world's way. Produces death as if there's no redemption, as if there's no restoration. See, the gospel's the power of God unto salvation. Why? He takes you out of that and places you into something new. It's a whole new perspective. It's you're in the light. Are you with me? So why am I taking this much time to stay on this one little point? To inspire you, stir you, propel you, hopefully, to make sure that in simplicity you believe it. That every day you wake up, you leave here tonight, I'm right with God because of what Jesus did. I'm starting there. See, if you don't start there, you'll never run well. You can be sincere as can be, but if you don't start there, you won't run well. You'll judge yourself according to your own life, your own standard. You won't be empowered by grace because you're releasing no faith in the truth. And it's the truth that makes me free. So if you're just weighing your life by your own actions and you're not just putting on righteousness, here's what I'm going to be bold and say to you. I know tapes running. Watch. When you believe in righteousness, it empowers your actions because it changes your heart. Are you with me? You're not trying to be a better person. You see you're created to be a better person. You actually believe the blood of Jesus. You believe new creation reality. You believe you've been made right in the sight of God. Even though you've done wrong, God sees you if you've always done right. And it inspires you. It restores integrity and honor and diligence and all the good things that were stripped away by sin. Are you with me? And Paul said... I'm not ashamed to preach it, even though I know they're going to whip me again. Now, you tell me this man is either loco or he sees something. And he knows it's brief moments of light affliction. Second Corinthians, he shares a whole list of what he's going through. And I look at that list as a pastor and I think he's going through all that. Whew, and he's like rejoicing in God and the truth. He's calling it brief moments. Of light affliction. Well, what he's calling light affliction on his list, just one of those things on his list causes most people to fall apart, call a counseling session, and just about give up. Why? Because we reveal when we do that that we're in the gospel for us. <laughs> yeah, uh-oh, I feel the uh-oh. How can... How can you be discouraged unless you're self-focused? If you're seeking first the kingdom and you're living for his namesake, where's discouragement ever even enter in? See, a true and pure motive protects you from all the things that kept us down. Like some of these things only lived because of where we live from. You take away where we live from, you take away the life of these things. So they came natural. They came through motive. You you were only angry because you had a need to be right. You were only angry because you had insecurity and identity crisis. And you wanted people to agree with you and be nice to you. And when you didn't get that, you flared up. So anger is an expression of self-centeredness. Discouragement is an expression of self-centeredness. That's not harsh. That's just raw, straight Expose it. Come on, because if discouragement was legitimate, then Jesus is like super motivated. How's he? How come he ain't discouraged? The man's doing right every day. Every day they're criticizing him. Every day they're trying to decide what's wrong. When he talks, they're not listening for what he's saying. They're listening for what they don't agree with. It's just every day he's healing a whole town and they're trying to figure out what devil's possessing him. 
every day. And you don't see one meltdown. You don't see one iota of a change. You don't see one time where man had the power to decide who he is. That's why he has the power to decide who men are. Because he knows who he is. He said he knows where he came from. He knows where he's going. He said the Father's always with me. I always do what he asked me to do. Whew. That's confidence. And he just keeps on loving. And now he's beat beyond description. He says, forgive them. They just don't know who they are. <laughs> See, it sounds too simple. But it's so powerful and it's so dynamic because it's who God is. And it's what he created every one of us to be. It's the truth. He created everyone. He's the firstborn among. He's like, tag, you're it. Now you run this race worthy of a prize. Yeah? Going to walk in the light as. Don't let nobody tell you that you can't live this way. It's so scriptural. You're supposed to put off the old man and his deeds. You're supposed to put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge, in agreement with or according to the image of the one who created him. So you're going to put on who he is. Why? Because that's who you're created to be. And when we didn't know that, he said, forgive them. They don't know that. Don't be afraid of this good news. Don't be afraid of believing that you've been made right with God. Don't get tricked into judging yourself. Mercy has triumphed over judgment. You'll give yourself what you deserve instead of him giving you the kingdom. Come on. Mercy triumphs over. Love has covered a multitude of. Okay, I'm not making light of sin. We all need to repent. But what do you do once you repent? Repent means change. Okay, watch. Okay. So now I have a conviction of my former life. And I'm hearing this message. And I'm going, duh. Why can't that be repentance? Why does it have to take three years and crying and 14 counseling sessions every six months? Why can't I just be a believer and go, duh. I was living what I was never created to live. Man, I was trapped in a lie. Yep, yep, yep. One man's disobedience cost me, and I, whoa, but one man's obedience, woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> why can't I, why can't I just put that on? And the moment I put that on, be holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. In his no, no, it's not just the way I see me because I'm on some delusional interpretation of Scripture. It's in His sight. We'll go back to Romans in a second. Go to, go to Colossians 1 with me. No, no, you got to see it's there. I know most of you know it's there, but you all got to see it's there. Okay, verse 21, Colossians 1. You, and who? You, I'm talking to you. Paul's talking to you. It's a good thing. And you, who? You. You were formerly alienated. You were trapped, literally, in a hostile mind, engaged in evil deeds. In other words, the way your mind was motivated created hostility towards God's kingdom, plan, purpose, and made you actually enmity with God because you worked and lived and flowed from a twisted mind that was self-centered. Do you get it? Okay. So you were alienated. You were enemies in your mind. I have New King James. This is what it says. You were alienated in enemies in your mind by wicked works, and yet now he reconciled. It didn't say that I did one thing to change while I was living that way. He reconciled, wanted to make friends and say, hey, I have a whole higher way. It's called the, just come unto me. I'll give you rest. Yeah? Come on, it's the truth. And then, and then look, so, so he reconciled us. How did he reconcile us? In the, body, in, in, in the body of his flesh through death. 
So a second ago, I don't understand this and I'm trapped in a hostile, self-centered, self-focused mind. And it's enmity to God. It's actually opposite of everything he stands for because it's all about me. And everything that motive produces looks totally opposite from what he looks like. And yet he created me for his image. Come on, it's all scripture. So in the body of his flesh through death to present me. Uh oh. Woohoo. In order to present you before him. See, King James says in his sight, before him is the same. I'm not against other trends. I read like a bunch of different ones just to get a whole. Watch. If you're holy, blameless, and above reproach before him, then you're holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Watch. At what point does faith put that on and believe that? Watch. Without trying to live holy, just be holy. Because if I'm reading Romans right in 6, it says if I yield myself and present myself as a member unto righteousness, righteousness herself, righteousness itself will produce its fruit to holiness. So if I can make a tree good, guess what its fruit will be? So Isaiah had a revelation way back then. He said, your trees of righteousness, the planting of the... So whose idea is it that you be planted and grow? That he might be glorified. Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. What's the purpose of this whole righteous judgment? So that the image and nature of God could get back on us and manifest through us and bring glory to God. <laughs> what did Jesus say? <laughs> glorify your son that I might glorify you. Yeah? Same Jesus told us to follow him. We've turned this thing, if we're not careful, we've turned this thing into works, legalism, and wrong motives. Just blessing and a destination made right when the bell rings. Just getting in the right book. Getting out of the wrong book. Making it all about me and what I can get from him instead of what I become in him. And that's why there's a lot of continued animosity between Christians. That's why our lives have not been impressive to unbelievers. We've had very little love to show even towards others because we're busy trying to make our life work in him. And that's why I have discouraged people that go to church. Because life is defining them instead of the life in them. And if you don't make that transition, life will always speak louder than truth. But the problem is it's only truth that makes you free. Not circumstances. Are you with me? Yeah, that's just flat out good. My heart's popping. No, that's just flat out good. In the body of his flesh through what? Death. To present you what? Holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Watch verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith. In other words, if you keep believing that and don't let anything change your mind. Now, how many people slip into guilt, condemnation, self-introspection, start judging themselves? Now, I understand that we look at our lives, but I'm in fellowship with God. I have a relationship with Holy Spirit. If I'm sincere in what I'm preaching and I'm living this and I'm walking out my life, my goodness, if I walk in anything that's not Him, you don't think I'll know it in a moment? Hello? My conscience is crisp and clear. My heart's alive and awake. And I'll never run and hide from him because I know him now. He's my father. So if that happens, what do I do? I run to him. Pew. And I understand you never created me for that. I thank you. You're making things strong and healthy in my life. God, you're making me wiser and sharper than I've ever been. I love the way you love me. And Father, I thank you. I just want to manifest who you are. Oh, God, thank you for forgiving me and washing me in it. You say you would just run to God and talk like that if you found yourself like in a bad attitude and something that, what would you do? Debrief it? Go in depression? Judge yourself? Get condemned? Lose two, three weeks of your Christianity? 
label yourself as a transgressor? Or would you run to God and stay clean? Why? Because your heart's convicted. Because it's alive. I preach it this way. I think you'll understand. I haven't found a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free. And see, when you preach that, religion says, I'm saying, he never sins. He said he never, ever sins. I've never said from a pulpit, I never, ever sin. I just don't think about sin, and it's not in the message. We're to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin. How can I reckon myself dead indeed to sin and keep boasting in, in 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 a false humility in my ability to commit it? Romans says, reckon yourself dead. Indeed, to sin. And what's the average Christian teacher talk about? Sin. We don't talk about righteousness. And then when you talk about it, red flag. Ooh, one of those. Yeah, a believer. A believer. See, if you don't believe this message, condemnation is going to be loud in your life. Guilt and shame, you will have no defense against it. Because you'll judge yourself according to yourself. Mercy will never triumph over judgment. And grace will never empower your faith to turn you into what he paid for. So what's happened to me? A little dangerous talking like this, tape running, people just watching everything you say to find fault with it. But it's just a reality. Watch this. So what's grace done in my life over these years? What's the benefit of living this way? Things that used to be in my heart aren't in my heart. I don't have to try not to do things that came easy. I don't even think about them. Why? Because I put on something new. And as a man thinketh, so he is. And if righteousness, and I present myself as an instrument of righteousness, and it produces its fruit to holiness, all of a sudden I find something in my heart called holy, which actually means a cut above. Set apart. apart. It's a cut above. It's set apart. It's sanctified. It's set apart. I find my heart holy. In other words, it's set apart from the perversity that's all around me, men driven by themselves. And I'm living in this place that was always there that I didn't see. And then when you see it and talk about it and live in it, you're called something else. No, it's just the way it is. It doesn't change. So Paul so understood it that even though they beat him half to death for saying it, he never stopped saying it. And you look at how many times they beat him with whips, beat him with rods. They pummeled him with stones. And he wouldn't stop talking about it. You can't tell me the man didn't see it. Are you with me? It's not a theology. He's not taking a strong stand in his theological position. He's communicating his relationship with God. And how God sees him. And the power of God unto salvation. You can't take his salvation. He loves not his own life unto death so his life can't be a tool to take it that's not the way we were taught to come into the gospel we come into the gospel loving our lives hoping God adds to it (laughs) I'm just telling you we come to God when everything's going terrible hoping he fixes it all instead it changes me We come to God if our marriage has failed, hoping he heals the marriage because I'm finding my identity through my spouse. And I can't function. Instead of coming to God to become the person that he created me to be so I can finally be a spouse. Are you with me? Come on, it's just real. We didn't get real far into Romans. (laughs) But you better hold... You better hold on to your faith and you better continue in this faith, steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel in which you heard. Do you realize you go to church your whole life nowadays and never hear this hope? You go to church your whole life and never hear this hope and not have anything to hold on to because you never heard it. 
Now you come here, you come to New Beginnings. I love the name of New Beginnings. There's probably how many New Beginnings on the earth? A lot of New Beginnings. But every church should just be New Beginnings. It's so perfect. It's not redundant. It's not a copycat, Pastor. It's perfect. Look, look. New beginning, as if you've never begun. So your past is erased. You have a present and a future. Wonder if we'd believe that and stop looking back and being Lot's wife when we're his bride. Why do we look back? I asked the Lord why we look back. He said it's the only place people ever found identity. Whether good or bad, they find their life, their identity in their past. People, people, 50 years old, they still talk about what it was like when they were growing up. They'll be acting out and they'll say, well, you don't know what I've been through, brother. And they got a story to justify their actions, but their actions are deception because their story's a lie. So at what point do you come out of darkness into the light? At what point do you put off the old and put on the new? At what point do you look up from whence comes your help and never look back? So you can apprehend. You forget what lies behind. Come on, it's all scripture. Okay, let's go back to Romans quick. What time, what time do I have till, sir? No, no, don't tell me that. Don't, no, you aren't even ready for that. Don't even tell me that. <laughs> but, you know, don't, whatever. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Because I'm going to be preaching in high gear for the rest of my days. <laughs> well, if we do go all night, I got one up on Paul. I have faith nobody's falling asleep. I don't know how they fall asleep on Paul. I was like, Paul, how'd you let somebody fall asleep when you was preaching? <laughs> like, did you get tired? Did you get toned down? I mean, I, I just can't. I'm not letting nobody go to sleep. <laughs> In fact, if you fall asleep when I'm preaching, I figure, and you father when to die, I figure, well, it must be your time. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They went and raised that man up, but I was just figuring, how'd you let a man fall asleep when you had the mic? I want you to see this in Romans 3. He, he, he defines the state of man. In verse 10, 11, 12, whether our hearts were just so far from him. I mean, we were, we were godless, be real. We were perverse. I mean, even, even the good we felt and the good that we seemed to do was always perverted because there was always motive in our heart. We were just so lost. Do you understand that we, even from little up, we were just self-centered. It was self-focused. We were aware of our self-conscious, right? Man. And he, and he talks about the law a little bit in 19 and 20. I don't want to get too wordy and have to get into too much to explain. But, but he says, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So that's pretty plain. You all understand that? So the law reveals, Paul said in Romans 7, he said, if, if the law didn't say thou shalt not covet, I would never know I was. So the law is good because it, convicted me it pricked my conscience and revealed to me hey i'm living that way so the law actually showed him that he was guilty you get it and that's what he just said there and then he said therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin so what he's saying is okay if the law is saying to do this and it's exposing what you're not doing there's no amount of effort to not do that anymore that's going to make you clean and establish you right in the sight of God because you've already missed one law. If you miss one, you're guilty of them all. So for you to try to say, okay, so I'm going to try to up my standard and get this right. You see? Saying nobody's going to be justified by the deeds of the law. Do you understand that? So watch what he says. He says, but now, because there is hope of being justified. But now, when? Right now. 
Not tomorrow. It's time to believe it now. You're right now. You're accepted now. You're justified now. You're loved now. You have purpose now. Yeah? Yeah. But what? But now, now. the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. Elisha and Moses shows up on the mountain. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Pretty cool day. Yeah? Yeah? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. Okay, now watch this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we got that established. We all need the gospel. We all need the finished work. We all need the blood of Jesus. We all need the cross of Jesus Christ. You get it? We've been tricked into... We look at him as a kid growing up. All I was ever taught was the whole purpose of the cross is so I wouldn't go to hell. That's all I was ever taught. That's all I heard my whole life. And it wasn't even so much that I go to heaven. The emphasis was I wouldn't go to hell. And if you read all these scriptures and all the context and all these scriptures, that's never even the motive, even a little bit. (laughs) But that was the whole motive. It's the only thing we had. So then I'm confused thinking, well, why does he care? Why does he want me in heaven? Why does he love me? And how can anybody forgive me like that? I mean, why does he put Jesus? Why would Jesus die? And go, well, because he loves you. Why? <laughs> like the way the gospel was cre- preached to me created questions, not revelation. It didn't change me. And, and it didn't motivate me to be different. Like, even if it did motivate me to be different, I'm, I'm handcuffed because I can't change without him. See, it's seeing this truth going, oh my goodness, I was born into a lie. I grew up something I was never intended or created to be. This is all perversion. And the motive in my heart was totally wrong. It was self-centered. It wasn't kingdom-minded. I wasn't living for his sake, his namesake, and the sake of others. I was all about me, myself, and I. Duh, time to repent. Come on. (laughs) And now I'm justified. Look the word up. Just as if you've never sinned. You're justified. Look, you do something and you get you get you get tried for something and and they justify you and and you get acquitted and they release you. Now the society will remember you were tried. And they'll suppose and they'll talk in the dark and the secret and sometime even in the open. Well, I bet he did it anyway. Well, remember? Oh, well, so and so. Well, yeah, remember? But in the court of law, in the court of law, you don't have that reputation. Now, in men's minds, so you see how important it is to be free from men's minds. So if you're insecure, men's minds matter. If you don't have true identity, men's minds matter. You get justified through the blood. Who knows people still remember your former days? Yep. Well, I remember when he used to. Oh, boy, we sat in a bar, me and him. And I remember this one night. Well, I don't even know if I should repeat it. Well, I will. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And what they're saying happened to the person they're talking about. But now this person's brand new. This is a new person. Right. Yeah? yeah. New heart, new life. Who? Who's been saved, and, and you, you, you look back on some things that used to be a temptation to you, and you don't even get it anymore. You're like, stuff will make you angry, and you're like, bother you. And you're like, you don't even relate. That's grace working through faith. That's God going deep on the inside, making the tree good. So the fruit can be good. You get it? That's not you trying to be a Christian robot. That's you being his son, his daughter, accepted in the beloved, forgiven. Yeah? And righteous in his sight. See? For all sin and fallen short 
of the glory of God. Being justified freely, freely by His grace through the redemption. That means brought back, bought back to original value. Wow. Woo! See, it's all here. I don't know how anybody can argue this ever. I don't even know why we fight over this stuff. I don't even know how somebody named Christian can hear somebody preaching on righteousness and go, Ah! Get back to the law! But they freak out. You mentioned grace. Ah! No, I've seen it. And I just make you laugh over it or we'll all cry. It's, it's tragic. But it doesn't change the scripture, the gospel. You still got to say, what am I going to believe? Don't let people talk you into bondage. Look, I've never seen anybody that stand and hold core, cool uh, hardcore and cold hearted on that thing and rah, I'm real theological live free they're angry at you they actually hate you in the name of the Lord they'll hate you in the name of the Lord and they'll write nasty things about you in the name of the Lord and the whole time the Lord's trying to woo you back to him and they're just revealing that they don't understand <sighs> being justified freely, freely, freely by His grace. Do you know what grace is? Grace isn't mercy. Grace is different than mercy. Mercy is different than grace. Mercy is something God gives you when you deserve no chance. And He gives you a chance. You don't deserve another try and He gives you a try. Mercy is when you're at the bottom and you've got nothing but you've got Him and He says, yes, you can. But grace is his empowerment. Grace is his willingness to pour out his power and ability on your behalf, even though you don't deserve it, never earned it, freely. God's grace, his power, his ability on your behalf by believing. So if I believe... I can live in righteousness. If I believe, I can be transformed. If I can believe that God's Spirit will come in me and turn me on the inside er, out, all of a sudden, by faith, grace is saving me. And now I'm living the life I believe. Watch. Without trying. <laughs> so you're not doing Christianity. You're becoming Christ-like. You get it? Come on. I know for some of you this is simple first grade start, but it's the power of God unto salvation. If, if we, if we skip, slip off the, the, the rock of righteousness, you don't want to start good like the Galatians and then... You know what I'm saying here tonight? I just felt like I was supposed to talk about righteousness a little bit and talk about some of these things. There's a redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Who's this Christ Jesus? It's the one God set forth as a propitiation, which means a mercy seat. Literally means mercy seat. He set him forth as a mercy seat by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance. God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Amen. Scripture is telling you you're clean. That God doesn't even see them anymore. Hallelujah. Then where does regret live unless it's in unbelief? Where does shame and guilt survive unless it's in unbelief? I got to believe and by faith through grace I'm saved. It's never again about where you've been. It's about where he's been. And that's where you find you. You don't find you there. You find you here. It's called born again. Come on. It's what inspires our hearts. I'm 27 years saved. You can tell I haven't calmed down. I calmed down enough to communicate. But I'm passionate and I'm excited. Why? Can't change what I see. You, I've woke up too many mornings right in the sight of God. 
And you're going you're gonna to talk me out of that and change my theology. No, it's my relationship. It's how God sees me. I just read it. It's how he sees me through the blood. That hasn't empowered me to live wishy-washy. That, that has cleaned me out and straightened me up. To live, watch, to live what was never possible before. And all of a sudden, grace is empowering me to live what I could never live on my own in my own strength. So the truth put a new heart in me, put a new motive in me. And with that new heart and motive, now you have new fruit. It's a work of grace. It's not mine. There's no boasting. Nobody has anything unless it's been given. All glory goes to him. But when you're living in it, now you love him all the more. Calm down, brother. It ain't all that. You don't understand. It's good news. Good news. The angel said, good tidings of... Well, I'm not being mean right now. But where's the great joy in the body of Christ? Where's joy inexpressible? If you, if you have joy inexpressible, you're a put on, you're drawing attention, and it ain't all that. <laughs> Judged by Christians. You got good tidings in your heart, and it's producing great joy. Oh, look at that. He's just putting on a... See, when you preach this, people say what you're not even saying. They say, he preaches and he's preaching that you don't ever have to sin. and You never sin and he never sins. That's a distraction. I never come out and say, I never sin or I don't have to sin. I don't even bring that topic up. I talk about why are you still thinking about it and talking about it? But people make you saying that. They put that in your mouth and it distracts everybody. So they say, oh, he's saying he's perfect. I am perfect. In the sight of God. And when I believe that, it empowers me to live the most perfect I can possibly live according to my faith. And that's hard to talk about today because so many people are sin conscious, holding positions in the church, wearing titles. Sin conscious. So if I wake up and try not to sin, guess what my focus is? But if I wake up and know I'm right with God and I just present myself unto him, guess where my focus is? So now there's faith in my heart and there's grace coming to empower my belief. Now my life is bearing fruit according to what I believe and it's not my work, it's his. So who gets all the glory? Woo! So it ain't just, oh, you're such a great Christian. No, I'm a believer. I'm, all I'm going to be judged for Hopefully in that day as I believed. Because outside of believing, I got no ability. But when I believe, His grace is sufficient for me. Woohoo! So 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 I don't want to be judged as a debater, an unbeliever. Sometimes we think unbeliever is people that didn't pray the sinner's prayer. An unbeliever are people that are fighting righteousness. People that are fighting the way God sees you through the blood of Jesus. Because if the just live by faith and you're fighting what we're to have faith in, then that would make you anti-faith. You're an unbeliever. We just think unbelievers are people that don't believe in Christ. What about a lot of people that don't believe a lot of things in Christ? You can believe in Christ and then not believe the most vital things about Him. You go to church your whole life and believe you prayed a sinner's prayer so you're going to heaven and you ain't going to hell and never pursue becoming love and don't even believe it's possible. Wow. Just relate to all the degenerate feelings and emotions you had growing up. Call them normal and say, well, God gave us emotions instead of getting redeemed and restored. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. And that would be called blindness and deception. And the God of this world blinds the eyes of those who don't believe. See, as soon as we hear scriptures like that, we think people that didn't pray the sinner's prayer. What about the people that don't believe in righteousness? What about the people that don't believe in His grace, His saving grace? What about the people that think grace is something 
greasy and perverted and giving people permission to stay the same. And the whole time they're believing that, their heart's getting hard and they're judging something that's beautiful. Are you with me? Please believe righteousness. A propitiation, a mercy seat, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Oh, and you think I'm supposed to calm down. The only way to live justified is faith in Jesus through this truth. Justified, watch. Just as if you've never justified. Guys, it's in your Bible. It's not my sermon. So why haven't I met countless people that just live justified? He says, I'll remember their lawless deeds no more. Then why do we remember? Come on, if you're justified, you're justified. At what point do you just believe he's put a new heart in you? At what point do you just believe the true convictions that are in you and the fact that you want change? I mean, just the fact that you show up at a special service like this says there's something, something in your heart looking for something. When do you just agree with that and go, yay? Yay. Yay. Yeah. (laughs) But you know, (laughs) I want to show you something. I preach this a lot. I want you to see this. This is is actually, it's amazing to me. I was at New Life for Girls. It's a girls recovery ministry I go to. I go there. I've missed a few months here because of my schedule because I was totally out of town on my days when I should have been there. But, but I try to go once a month. I've been there once a month since the year 2000. This was probably the, I think I missed three out of the last four months, which has never happened in 22 years. So I'll be there the first Wednesday of December. I'll be there. So when I was up there and I was preaching this, they were all sitting there looking at me like, because I shared what the writer wrote, and then I shared what Genesis says. And they were like, oh, no, thinking like the Bible was lying. <laughs> See, in Romans, he's talking about Abraham. He's talking about Abraham being the father of our faith. And that he was marked for righteousness because he believed God. Who knows that that's in your Bible? I want you to see this. He talks here too. This is where he talks about. Look at verse 4. Well, for what, what does scripture say? Verse 3 of Romans 4. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for what? Righteousness. Now to him who works to get righteousness. Who's working. Not, see, do you see where self-consciousness is your motivation? Do you see where pride would kick in? Do you see how self-centered it would be? To try to work your way to righteousness. Well then you should get a trophy. Now there's some more righteous than others. Now you got better Christians. Lesser Christians. Now you got great Christians. And maybe Christians. (laughs) Instead of a room full of believers. That all need the same blood. For the same mercy. Ain't that something? You see how twisted man's works can get? Because all of a sudden you're just a great Christian because of your works instead of your faith in God's empowerment. You have to understand the more you believe what we're preaching tonight, the more you'll walk in the grace that's available so the more your life will look like you believe. But there's no boasting in men. Why? Because you'd never have that if you didn't see that because God did that. Did you get it? Oh, if we could just stay so simple and believe that what I believe makes that much difference. (laughs) To them that. So what's going to happen in the end? Men will be judged for believing or not believing. Not whether they pray to prayer or not. We make it, did you pray the sinner's prayer? 
No, did you believe? Did you believe righteousness? Did you believe redemption? Did you believe you have a present and a future? Did you put off the old and put on the new? Why didn't you do that? I thought you believed. See, you'll know them by their... And what a man lives reveals what he sees and believes. Your life reveals what you believe. Come on. It's not your conversation over coffee. It's the life you live. The life you live reveals what you believe. That's not harsh. That's just sober. Don't be afraid of sober. You all okay? But to him who does not work, verse 5, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Man, Paul is just boldly writing, isn't he? See, this is after 21 years of living Jesus. You get knocked off a horse 21 years later, this is what you're writing. Whew, we ought to pay attention. He's been beat so many times for writing this, and he's just still writing away. He'll never learn. No, the problem is he already knows. Yeah? He who doesn't work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So we got robes of righteousness. Why? Because we believe. Okay. So even David wrote this. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. I mean, these are just amazing, amazing scriptures. So then he's talking about Abraham here. He's talking about why he was circumcised or uncircumcised. He said why he was uncircumcised. And that's why faith is considered righteousness for him. And then uh, look at verse 13. Let's just read. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Because Abraham was an old boy, right? Sarah was an old girl. They had never pulled it off up until now anyway. And now they're way past years and they're going to have a child. And it don't make no sense to the mind, that's for sure. So if those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void. And the promise made of no effect. So he's just reversing some things and trying to teach here. It's very powerful. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the law reveals our need for a Savior. True? So therefore, is it of faith? Or, or therefore, it is of faith that it might be accounted to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So you got to think about what he's talking about. God pulls Abraham out. Boom prophesies over him and speaks this thing over him. He wasn't circumcised. He didn't do anything to earn this. God chose him, boom, told him, you're going to have a son. And he talks about the stars and the grains of sand. And, the, and oh my goodness. And it's like, that's going to be your generations, your children. You're going to be a father. And I mean, it's like, what? And Abraham's like, what, 90 maybe when this all happened? So it's not that he earned that or worked that. He just gave him that promise. So Abraham was supposed to what? Just believe it. So as it is written, I've made you the father of many nations. You can find all this in Genesis. In the presence of him whom he believed. Okay, watch this. God who gives life to the dead and causes those things which do not exist as though they did. So people that teach faith and like that, I like call it hardcore faith. Like, they love this section of scripture, right? I love this section of scripture preaching righteousness and forgiveness and, and justifying us. Watch, you'll see why. He's talking about Abraham right now. He's, he's saying, who contrary to hope, even though he was old man, and Sarah was an old woman, in contrary to hope, in hope he believed that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now watch this, verse 19. This is an incredible testimony of Abraham. And not being weak in the faith, he did not consider his own body. Already dead, since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness also of Sarah's womb. Now watch this, strong language. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory 
to God. Look at this. And being fully convinced that what God said and promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not imputed for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who what? Believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, and he was raised because of our justification. So there's the same message, the same language, but here's what I want you to see about Abraham. Romans records this about Abraham. He's contrary to hope, against hope. He didn't waver. He wasn't weak in faith. He didn't even consider his own body. When you look in Genesis, he did everything that Romans says he didn't do. Everything. He considered his body. He considered Sarah. Sarah pretty much said, look, Abe, this ain't working. <laughs> I'm old, and so are you. Now, Hagar over there, she ain't so old. I know I can't pull it off. You might still be able to pull it off. If you sleep with my maid, servant Hagar, it might be that God fulfills what he told you through her. And I don't think Abe said, let me pray and fast about it. I think he said, you want me to go into Hagar? Yep, got my permission, Abe. Hagar! Just telling you. <laughs> he produces Ishmael. He's the son of his flesh, not a promise. God called him out in front of him in Genesis 17, maybe. He said, Abraham, you stand before me and be righteous. And he reiterates this whole promise. He starts going and Abraham says, oh, that Ishmael might stand before you. He says, no way, he can't. He's the son of your flesh. In other words, you considered your body. You were weak in your faith. And you tried to do something to help me fulfill what only I can fulfill. Now, that happened in Genesis. So why doesn't Romans talk about that? Why does Romans talk about Abraham as if he never produced Ishmael, never wavered, and never lost hope? Because he repented and believed what God said first, and he was justified as if he never didn't believe. And in Romans, through the blood of Jesus... All the writer can write is his repentance and the fruit of it. He can't record Genesis because it doesn't exist. He remembers your lawless deed no more. Because when you read Romans, there is zero indication of Ishmael. Zero indication of sleeping with the maidservant. Zero indication of wavering and questioning and wondering about time frames. And in Genesis, he didn't hope against hope. He gave in to reality. And he grew weak in faith and he leaned on the arm of the flesh and the wisdom of man. And Romans has him up here as a believer that never wavered. Why? Because when God said, stand before me, and he said, oh, that Ishmael might, he said, there's no way. He's the son of your flesh. It has to be the son of promise. Now, here's how it's going to go down. I told you once, I'm reminding you. Bam. Abraham, at that point, must have said, duh. Watch. He must have said, duh. Not, Ooh, I'm such a terrible believer. I don't know. I mean, God even told me face to face, and I still didn't get it. I'll never get it. No, he must have said, duh, what was I thinking? And he repented and turned from and turned to and never looked back. And now it's accounted to him as right with God, justified through believing as if he never missed it. You want another one? Who was his wife? She's in the patriarchs of faith. In the list of believers that are documented as patriarchs of what faith is to look like in a human being. It says, by faith, 
Sarah received strength to conceive. Well, when you look at Genesis, she laughed at God and she lied in a two, three minute moment. That is not a good day. God's sitting at your dinner table. He tells Abe, hey, about this time, such and such, Sarah's going to conceive. She's listening through the curtain and chuckles and says, huh, after all this time and now my ma the maid servant's going to find pleasure? I don't think so. <laughs> and God said, why did Sarah laugh? And he must have looked at her. And she said, got all nervous. I didn't laugh. <laughs> oh, yes, you did. Hebrews doesn't say anything about laughing or lying. It says she's a patriarch of faith, and you ought to follow her example, and you ought to believe like Sarah did. Why is it in Hebrews that way? Because at some point right after that happened, Sarah must have said, duh. Do you see how powerful righteousness is? And how complicated we can make it if we're not careful. And how people put pressure on themselves, more pressure, more pressure, and never wake up and believe they're clean. And they weigh themselves by themselves instead of weigh themselves through Him. You have to put on Christ. Why is this so important? Because you'll never live in righteousness, and if you don't see you're righteous, how will you produce the fruit of it? Here's the other use of the word righteousness in your Bible. It's any expression or manifestation of the nature of God. A work of righteousness is anything that reveals who he is. His goodness, his loving kindness, his tender mercies, his love. That is the work of righteousness. How can we possibly work the work of righteousness if we don't believe we've been made right? An apple tree is not trying to produce an apple to prove to itself in the world it's an apple tree. A cherry tree is not in the orchard. Oh! <laughs> Woo! I always knew I was a cherry tree. See, that's just weird. You got to make it sound weird and you got to act weird with it so that people don't get weird and do it. There ain't no apple tree producing an apple to prove it's an apple tree. The only reason an apple tree is producing an apple is because it is an apple tree. The only way you could ever live in righteousness is believe you were made right. The only way you'll bear the fruit of the nature of God is when you believe we were created for that nature and you've received it when you got born again and you're never looking back, you're looking up. And you got the present, and you got things to come. There's another important reason this is really, but that's the reason it's important. Second Peter 1 says, we have like precious faith through the righteousness of God that comes through Jesus Christ. You and I have like precious faith. We believe the same because we see we've been made right. Come on. come on, it's all through your Bible. But here's another thing that's really beautiful about it. We pray for the sick a lot. And a lot of times we pray for the sick because they're sick. And that makes sense and I get it. We pray for the sick. But we should pray for the sick because God doesn't impute sin through Jesus and we're forgiven. He always marries forgiveness of sins and healing. Scripture after scripture. It's married all the time. I don't even know why we argue over that one. He forgives our sin and heals all our disease. James says, is any among you sick? Let him ask for prayer. Have the elders pray over them, anointing them with oil, praying the prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And if they've committed any sin, it shall be forgiven. What's he saying? To be healed is to be forgiven. He says, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. What's he saying? To be healed is to be forgiven. To be forgiven is to be healed. They lower a paralytic through the ceiling of a house. And he doesn't say, get up and walk. He says, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Why? Because he's a teacher and a good one. 
you know they didn't tear the roof off to hear your sins are forgiven. They don't even know what that, that's not even on their list. They're trapped under the law, they're condemned. When Jesus called God his Father, that's worthy, double worthy of being killed. Bad enough you healed on the Sabbath, now you called God your Father. They were so estranged from the person of God and relationship that when Jesus implied that God was his Father, that was worse, pretty much worse than healing on the Sabbath. He said, now they wanted to kill him all the more. Because he made himself by calling God his Father, therefore equal with God. That means on the same plane, in the house, in the family. So when we preach this, we're not saying we're God. We're saying we're his children. What child doesn't have the daddy in them? That's how it was intended and created. God made Adam with daddy in him. Don't eat the tree. Don't eat the knowledge of good and evil. That's the day you'll surely die and you won't see daddy in you. He didn't fall over dead when he ate the tree. But God said it's the day you surely die. So he had to, something had to die. That's why when Jesus rose from the dead in John 20, said to Mary, go tell my brethren, I'm going to my God, my Father, and your Father. My God and your God. He's saying he's not only my Father, he's your Father. They said, teach us to pray. When you pray, pray saying, our Father. What's he doing? He's the way, and he's leading men back to the Father. He comes up from the dead and he comes in the room and they're afraid for the Jews are going to kill him. And he shows him his, and he says, peace be with you. And then he shows him his scars and said, peace be to you. Because when they saw it was him, they're like, oh, we rejected him. And he's like, listen, I know how you're feeling right now, but chill. Love you guys. Just love you guys. As the father sent me, find me a limit in that. As the father sent me. So I'm sending you. See, we always think power and glory and might. For God so Don't ever forget it. If you don't go in love, don't go. Because you misrepresent him. He doesn't do love. He is love. Everything works through love. If you're going outside of love, you're going for a reputation. You're going for a testimony. You're going for an identity. But if you go because of love, you're well out of the picture. Because all you see is him. Are you with me? He says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And then what's he do? He breathes and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Why didn't he just say it? Why didn't he just say receive Holy Spirit? He all holds all things together by the word of his power. Why didn't he just say receive Holy Spirit? Why did he breathe? Because he's letting us know he's taking them back to day one. He's starting over through his blood as if sin never happened. Come on. Adam, the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. What happened? He got separated from God. Everything he was created to be died. The image of God was lost. He was reduced back to a form of what he was intended to be. Before Adam, Holy Spirit's hovering over the expanse of the water and it had no form. And there was chaos. What happened after sin? No form. Chaos. Now Jesus, redemption, blood speaking better things than Abel's blood. Which judged Cain, he says, as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. We're right back on course. We're right back on track. We're right back where we were in the beginning. <sighs> Receive Holy Spirit. And man became a living being. Yeah? As if sin never happened. Now watch. The knowledge of good and evil is still there. The tree's still there. And the snake is still whispering. Follow me. Follow me. The day you eat that tree just always brings death. Follow me. <clears throat> Watch this. Take heart, son. They broke open the roof. 
Now, you know, if you were his three or four friends and you dropped that man through, you want him to get up out of that bed. And when Jesus says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven, you're thinking, okay, great. How about getting him up? I'm just being real. Because you don't understand what he's saying. As soon as he said, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven, the people went. They just started murmuring. Who's he thinking he forgives sin? And as soon as they did, he perceived it and said, how come you guys always in your heart? How come everything I say in your heart? What's easier to say to you? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk. But to show you the Son of Man has the power to forgive sin. Go ahead, son. Get up and walk. What's he doing? He's teaching the power of righteousness. Saying that all this stuff that has come upon man has come through sin. So if he takes away the root of it, then the fruit of it should be subject to the same truth. Watch. He bore your sins, 1 Peter 2. I read this book. Nobody talking me out of it. He bore your sin and my sin in his body on the tree that we having died to sin. See, we can't even hear the Bible in today's church that we having died to sin. You know what people are trained to think? Yeah, but brother, we always sin. We're always going to sin. We're always sinning. Everybody's sinning. We're probably sinning now. We're probably sinning while we're breathing. If that's all you can challenge Scripture with and keep wearing that identity, that's all you'll ever experience. When will you humble yourself and actually hear Scripture? Or does God presumptuously write the Bible? That we, having died to sin, what's he talking about? Just the act, the identity, the stain, the memory. Everything about sin. You die to it. That we, having died to sin, purpose might live for... What did we talk about all night? That we might live for... Not sin, died to it. Not even its conversation. See... We say, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. We think that's humble. That's false humility. That's the wrong identity. You're wearing a garment that you should have stripped off of you a long time ago. That conversation is dead where faith's concerned. And only then can you wear righteousness, and only then can righteousness produce her fruit unto holiness. And only then will your life actually change by the grace of God. That's what men are fighting in ignorance and don't even realize what they're fighting. And you couldn't beat that truth out of Paul. You couldn't social media it out of him, I'm sure. If you couldn't beat it out of him, you sure couldn't talk it out of him. Calling everybody a this and a that. And everybody's God's assessment crew. He's a false teacher. He's a false prophet. He's a heretic. He's a this. He's a that. Wonder if everybody would shut all that down and just go out and love somebody. Most of the people that are writing that stuff are angry anyway. (sighs) He bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree that we having died to sin. It's in your Bible. You can argue all you want. It says it. You having died to sin might live for and by his stripes you were 1 Peter chapter 2. It's there. It's there, ain't it? So that we might what? Yeah, but brother, you're always going to sin. Everybody sins. What are you saying? I mean, we're probably sinning right now. You know, we just don't know it. (laughs) See, when you're holding that conversation, guess what you're robbing yourself of doing? Living Living in righteousness. So you'll never bear the fruit that it's intended to produce. You'll never... Walk, live, move in the nature of God. That's the work of righteousness, the manifestation of the nature of God. You're made for His image. You're made for His image. You get it? 
So honestly, I've preached this my whole Christian life. Like, the strong motivation to pray for the sick shouldn't just be because they're sick, because that usually just engages empathy, sentiment, and emotion. We should actually be inspired to pray for the sick, and faith should rise in our heart because of the forgiveness of sins. Because we're ambassadors to God, not imputing men's trespasses, but pleading through our lives and through our hearts like Jesus did, be reconciled to God. Why? Because he didn't impute their trespasses. He's calling them home. So when you go preach saying the kingdom of God is here, that's why you heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and cast out the dead and raise the dead and cast out devils. Yeah? Yeah. That's Matthew 10. Luke 10 says, just go heal the sick. Whatever city you're in. What city? Whatever. Heal the sick there. What sick? The. And tell them the kingdom of God's here. In other words, it's because his kingdom's here. And what's the kingdom? The outrang and manifestation of the king. Yeah? You want to pray for the sick? We probably ought to now. Yeah? We ought to pray for the sick. Why? Because we're sick? Who knows being sick is a bummer. But you can't let it eat you up. You can't let it identify you. You got to hold on to righteousness. And you got to say, you know what? You didn't do this to me. You ain't trying to teach me nothing. You taught me through Christ. You made me clean. You made me free. And I just believe I can receive all things. And I'm just thanking you, God, for loving me and forgiving me. See, we've prayed for people in my life that we didn't see a change. And instead of getting heady about it, analytical and rewriting scripture, we just keep on, you know what? I can't see scripture changing. I'm not turning faith into a point in time, hit, miss, win, or lose. So I need to hold on to a truth until that truth makes me free. Yeah. When my mama died of sickness, I'm not changing my theology and letting my mother be the rock in which I build my belief. I'm not getting hurt and sentimental. Yeah? Because I'm looking to Jesus and saying, here's the will of God revealed. And when you see me, you've seen the Father. So I guess I'm growing up. I'm growing up into him in all things. I'm a work in progress. But if I keep changing my mind, when will I ever get there? If I change my mind to suit my emotions, I would be self-centered, wouldn't it? Come on, my hair's white enough. I've lost enough folks. I can talk this way. You can't judge me being insensitive. Remember last year when I showed up here, I was just on the heels of my brother, just fell over dead. Remember? I was a month in, a month and a half in. My brother just left my yard, and that was the last I saw his face. He was all happy with his buckets of deer meat, going to get his sausage, and he never left the busher. This is not, this is, don't change your theology. You thank God for the blood of Jesus that saved your brother. Saved your brother. Saved my brother. See, it's amazing how we fail to have faith because we live in this sentimental world and we can't even see then because we're so fixed on now. All I lost was physical time and I miss him. I miss my brother more now than I probably did when I was here last year because I've realized how many times he's not here because we were close. We were probably best friends. But you can see I haven't calmed down. I'm not bewildered. I didn't change my mind about him or his goodness. Why? Because I believe. And I'm not going to risk answering questions we don't understand at the cost of violating the things I know. Because if you get so many questions, it starts to cloud out the things you always knew. Next thing you know, it's like you don't know nothing. Because you're making unanswered questions of the priority instead of what you know. And what I know is God's good. What I know is he shed the blood of Jesus. My brother's alive and in his presence. What I do know is life is a gift. And I'm going to live it by faith till the day I stand before him. Woo! That's the things I know. Yeah? And do I miss my brother? Yeah. Have I grieved his loss? Yep. 
but not without hope. He said, you grieve, but not without hope. He didn't say, you don't grieve. He said, you don't grieve as if you have no hope. Are you with me? Who would be in this room tonight if we prayed for the sick? You say, you know what? It would be amazing to receive healing. I got something in my body, my life, my blood, something going on that I would receive prayer for healing. Who would that be? Let me see you. Let me see you. Okay, we got, we got a hand for you. We're going to pray for you. Who, who here, if you were healed, you wouldn't really know it because it's something time would need to tell or you'd have to get a test or... Yeah, stand to your feet. Just that group right now, real quick. Just stand to your feet. You really wouldn't know if you were healed for what you're standing for because it's something that either comes or goes, it's internal, you'd need a test or you'd need time to tell. Please stand to your feet. Don't, let's not come this far and then not go all the way. Come with me. It's really beautiful what I'm seeing God do everywhere I go. I was in a room two weeks ago. It was just phenomenal. We just did this. Got people involved and I just got quiet. It was hard. I got quiet. <laughs> Because I'm not the healer. He's the healer. And we're his people. And I got people involved. And that was just amazing. I, it was amazing. We'll see God do it tonight. But this group here is very important. This is what I want you to understand. He heals because he loves. And you have to believe God loves you. That's where faith begins. Faith works through. Faith doesn't work because you have a need. Faith works because you have a God that loves you. You have a covenant. You have a father. Are you with me? So the people that stood up, this is what I want you to do. And the next group is the same way. Here's all I want you to do right now is just believe this one thing. No matter what you've been through, no matter what this thing you stand for has cost you and how long it's been there. I know that sounds easy to say, but bear with me. Watch. You have to settle in this. I know you love me. You have to love me or you'd have never sent your son. See, you can't say, well, if you love me, then how come? Who's seen people do that? Rationale. You've seen it as a pastor. I've seen it like, well, if God loved me, then how come I just got laid off and wrecked my car all in a week and my spouse is acting crazy? <laughs> yeah, people say, if, if God really loved me. Well, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Whenever they ask Jesus a question from a wrong attitude, he never answered one time in your Bible. Right. He always responded with a question. So when people are mad and they, well, if God really loved me, how? you never answer that question. You always ask them a question. You say, well, let me ask you a question. If God didn't love you, why did he send his son? Because that's where you start and that's where you finish. Because he's the author and the finisher of your faith. And if you put him in question in his love, now you're just driven by need. And that'll crush you in time. So all I want you to do is believe God has to love you and you never send his son. If you're sitting near him, just tap somebody. Get that standing if you're sitting near him. Just turn, get him. Just tap him, take a hand. Just say, hey, I'm just going to believe with you. When you pray, Listen. We'll teach on this in a little bit, a little more distinct, but well, we can do it now. Whoever noticed when you go to pray for the sick, our focus gets on our prayer and we try to pray right, powerful and anointed. <laughs> and we get self-conscious and we try. <laughs> <laughs> be made whole in Jesus name is probably plenty. Be healed in Jesus name is plenty. When there's a revelation, let's stop putting faith in our prayer and let's put faith in him. And let's not get tricked into self-consciousness and get into works. If it's your prayer that heals people, we should all be going to prayer college and graduating. Yeah. It's your faith in him and his love and his finished work. So here's what we're doing right now. You just say this. Say, be made whole in Jesus' name. Just pray that over your person. Be made whole in Jesus' name. No more sickness. No more weakness. In the name of Jesus. Completely whole. Never again a symptom. And never again a trace. Of this situation. In Jesus name. Now if you're being prayed for. Thank God he loves you. Or he did never send his son. Just believe he loves you. And thank God he's the one. That makes change. So father we thank you for that. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Okay good. You guys can grab your seats quick. And let's do this. So if that was our first group. Our second group is what? We would know. You would know if you were healed. So the second group. So if you're here and you want prayer, I need you to stand up for me right now. If there's anybody that has back, leg issues, it's hard to stand. You need to just go like this so I can see where you're at and we'll get somebody to you. Anybody? Rather sit down than stand. 
Okay, there's a hand right there. You see her? Somebody, we're going to get her in a second, okay? We're coming to get you. Okay, so the people that are standing right now, if, if you were healed without exaggeration tonight, you would be able to tell, you would know, right? Is that what you're saying? So you'd be able to check your body and your body would be able to tell you like, hey, wow, I could... Some of us live protected. Some of us have situations where we try not to do certain things. So tonight, I want you to start to do some of those things that would let you know without exaggeration tonight. I want you to check those things. Exaggerating is lying. You know that, right? So we're not looking for the right answer tonight. We want you made whole. Are you with me? Okay, so we have everybody up that needs to be up. Yeah, don't hold back on me. Don't make me go fishing. I'm a good fisherman. Don't make me, I shouldn't have to go fishing. You should just jump up to your feet. We got everybody? Some, every once in a while you have somebody in a room that says, well, I just don't want to claim it. You're not claiming it. You're saying there's something in my life that I believe God will change because he loves me and it's less than wholeness. So it's not a faith thing to stay sitting. You just jump up and let us agree with you. Okay, good. I feel like we got everybody. Okay, and we have this dear lady that's, that's got her hand up. So here's what I need you to do. I need everybody to put your hand up that stood up. Just one hand that stood up. That stood up for prayer. This is just for identification so we don't lose you in a minute. Now, now watch this. Please, if you're nervous, I really want you on my team. Like this is a safe environment. So if you're nervous when I say this and you go, oh my goodness, please just push yourself through and jump up. The people sitting, I want the people sitting to be my prayer team. Whether you've ever prayed for the sick or not. If you've never prayed for the sick, that would be amazing. So I need you to jump up. The people that are sitting, just jump up and grab somebody and say, hey, I've never done this before. <laughs> but one-on-one, one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one, go get a person. Don't pray yet. Don't pray yet. Don't pray yet. Just go claim them. Just have fun. Smile. And just say, hey. And just go around till we got everybody. If you're claimed, put your hand down. Leave it up if you're waiting. Put your hand down if you're already claimed. People, please help me and run around and find somebody with their hand up yet. Please. Please. I got, I got a lady here. I got a lady here. I got a young man here. I got a young man there. And if you feel comfortable, ladies on ladies, you can go back and grab those ladies in the back row. Do I have anybody, any guys that will help me? Any, oh, we got, we got everybody covered? Ooh. Okay, only have your hand up if you're waiting for someone to pray for you. Do you have, everybody have somebody. Put your hand down if you have a prayer partner. Are they still waiting, these ladies? Oh, they all need somebody? Okay, good. Got them? All right, we got you covered. I think you're in good hands. <laughs> it's not just all state. Is that all state? Who's in good hands? <laughs> it's Jesus. <laughs> okay. Everybody covered? Okay, look here. This is what I want you to do. Remember how I said about when we pray for the sick? Who's ever prayed for the sick in here? A bunch of people? Tell me if this ain't true. When you go to pray for the sick, we get really focused on our prayer. We try to pray right. We're like, Father God, I just thank you. And I just, and I come to you in the name of Jesus. Wow. <laughs> and, and when we do that, a lot of times we shut it down before we even get started. Because if God's moving through that, then it works and we're going to have to pray better and more powerful. And all of a sudden, you're the prayer warrior. I want to be known as a believer. So what we're going to do is, in Matthew 17, it says, faith will say to the mountain, move. So, and he's talking about epilepsy, so you can't say it's not sickness involved. In that situation where he says that, the text, they're saying, why couldn't we heal that epileptic boy? And he talks to them about their unbelief and their little faith. And then, and then perverse thinking is really what it boils down to. It's a whole other teaching that I could get into. But at the end there, he says, for truly I tell you this, or assuredly I tell you this, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, meaning epilepsy could be diagnosed as a mountain, say to the mountain, move, and the mountain will what? And nothing shall be impossible for, he doesn't say God, he says for you. So here's what we're going to do. Take three seconds. Don't pray yet. Just take three seconds. Tell the person that's going to pray for you the three-second version of why you stood up and what you're believing to change. Just give them like herniated disc, arthritis pain all through my body. I got degenerated knees. I can't hear out of my left ear. 
whatever. Just give them the three-second version. Just tell them what it is. Don't pray yet. Don't pray yet. Just tell them what it is. Y'all got it? You should have it. Everybody got it? Okay. Hey, hey. We're not handing out snacks yet or anything. No juice, no drink. Everybody, <laughs> come on back. Hey, come on back. Y'all got it? Y'all know what you're believing for? Now, there's a reason I did this. So you can keep it simple and you don't have to try to pray right or powerful, okay? So if they said, I have a herniated disc, watch this. Disc, you be completely made whole. Pain, you leave in Jesus' name. Back, be made whole in Jesus' name. Who knows, we can pray in a few seconds, be sincere, believe his love for them, and not get self-conscious and get into works. I think we've been so tricked thinking that there's some kind of holy prayer. We got to be in the right place to pray. Wow, laser prayer. When God's just looking for people with childlike faith that believe he loves the person, he's a healer. Like, be healed in Jesus' name. If you start praying, which I wish we would all pray for the sick in public, man, I wish we would all just start loving on people everywhere. But see, what would it look like if you stop somebody hurting and you're sincere and you just say, listen, it, it won't take but a few seconds. Nobody will even know. I just want to pray for you. I believe God, he just loves you and he can change anything. And you just pray for three, four, five seconds instead of uncomfortable. And then now you're praying there four generations and a half hour later, you forgot what you started to pray for. <laughs> you prayed for revival in New Jersey. And <laughs> No, when you meet people in the streets, they're already nervous. Sometimes they're just being kind and let you pray. It's not that they have faith. They're just like, you're too nice to say no to. Or they're, they're not the personality to shut you down. And they're like, oh, okay. Or they thought you were going to put them on your list and kneel at your bed tonight. Now you got their hand and you're praying in public. And they're like, oh, you mean right now? <laughs> yeah. Ha! No, it's just simple. Like arthritis, you leave every symptom, every pain you go. In Jesus' name. Eyes you see, ear you hear. In Jesus' name. See, that, that puts it all right back on him, his love, his goodness. And when you're getting prayed for tonight, the people that stood up, he has to love me or he'd have never sent his son. See, that just works. Are you with me? So we're going to pray. I'm only going to give you five or six seconds. That's for your sake because I love you. Nobody will get self-conscious, nobody will get in the way, and nobody will get into works. So we're going to pray, and then we're actually going to take the time after I say, okay, wrap it up. Obviously, you're praying in the name of Jesus. Sometimes I acknowledge God's love for people. I say, in the name of Jesus, Father, thank you for your amazing, unfailing love. Because people need to see his love, right? And believe it. So then we're going to have the people that were prayed for. Take the time without exaggeration. We didn't bring no music up here. We ain't ramping the atmosphere. In fact, I try to make it as dry as I can so that we just learn to believe. And then we're going to check our bodies. And we're going to see what's going on. Some of you will know it's different. You'll be like, whoa. Don't just quickly say, I'm healed. Totally check it. I don't want exaggeration. I'm not looking for a list of the right answers. I want you blessed and changed. All right? Because here's the raw truth. The cynical will mock this all day long, but faith people understand. Watch. We're not turning faith into a point in time anyway. It's not hit, miss, win, or lose. It's my heart to believe what he accomplished. But tonight, here's what we're going to learn. If you see your body healed completely, that's a no-brainer. That's like, woohoo! Yeah, I'm healed. If you're healed somewhat, on the streets, I've never had anybody not let me pray the second time if they were healed somewhat. They'll be like, no, serious, it's like 65%. And they're trying to convince you, and you're like, no, I believe it. I was wishing it was 100. Let's just pray again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then you'll see the one that we're almost all afraid of, that sometimes you see nothing change in that moment. That's the number one, by the way, number one reason that people don't pray for the sick in their life. They're afraid nothing will happen. Because they're afraid nothing will happen. They don't pray for the sick. So guess what they always have? Nothing. What they fear is always what they have. So tonight, if your body doesn't change when they pray, oh, you shouldn't have said that. You just filled the room with unbelief. No, I'm teaching and I'm helping. Watch. 
Tonight, we're not going to let go. Tonight, we're not going to say, oh, well, see, I know this always happens where I get prayed for. Nothing ever changes. I shouldn't even stood up. Wonder what's wrong with me. Why'd she get healed? Why'd he get healed? Why am I never healed? Wonder. Something's got to be blocking. That's what people do. And they run their mind, run their mind at the cost of identity, at the cost of faith, at the cost of his love, and they get in an analytical war. Tonight, nobody or any night, nobody is allowed to do that. Ever again. Christians have one response. You love me. What you're doing to me is amazing. And I so appreciate your love. So tonight, here's what we're going to do. If your body doesn't change when they pray, I want you to listen to a testimony. I want you to listen to another testimony. I want you to thank God he's a healer. And just thank God for what he's doing in them and what he's doing in you. And then check your body after you hear that testimony. And just stay in that place where we're not letting go. You're not getting another person. Your person is plenty. <laughs> we're not switching out people. Hey, I want that young man. As soon as he touched her, she was healed. I want her in your person. Get out of here. <laughs> No, I know how we are. We're like, well, that river's flowing in you, brother. You need to come over here, here. As if the other person's a dry prune or something. No, we're all growing. We're all learning and we're all in faith tonight. So here's what we're going to do. We're not letting go tonight. We're going to believe what we set out believing and watch and see what happens in this room. Like popcorn, I always use this phrase, like popcorn in a bag. We're going to see things keep changing because we won't change our mind. And we're going to see the power of faith and how we can continue in faith for the rest of our lives in every situation. Amen? Amen. So you all got it? You, don't, you didn't forget what you're praying for, right? Okay. So I'm going to give you five to six seconds. You be sincere. Don't get wordy. Five to six seconds. Speak to the mountain. Boom. Tell it to go in Jesus' name. We're going to trust the finished work of Christ, the love of God, and the power of God. Not our prayer. Our faith in Him and His finished work. Who knows we can all do this and be sincere? Yeah? You ready to do it? Are you ready? Go ahead. Give your person the kingdom. Five, six seconds. Pray over them. Jesus' name. Yeah. Okay. Start, start winding that down. Start wrapping that up. That's good. Start wrapping it up. In Jesus' name. Now, if you were prayed for, thank him that he loves you or he'd have never sent his son. Thank you, God. And I need you to begin to check your bodies all over the room. Just start checking your bodies. When you know you're healed, when you know you're healed, let me know. Make sure you know and then let me know. Check your bodies all over the room. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Check them out. Check them out. When you know, let me know. Somebody let me know when you're healed. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. These are checking. Thank you, God. Thank you. We're not nervous. We're not looking for results. We want legitimate things to change. So I'm good with just getting you to keep checking. Thanking God he loves you. Check your bodies. Anybody in the room know they're changed by now? Anybody know they're healed? Let me know if you know. In Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Anything changed yet? Anything changing? I'm just kind of waiting here. Let me ask this question. Who feels like you're somewhat changed? You didn't raise your hand because you're not 100%, but you know you're better. Okay? Is there anybody completely better right now? Anybody completely better? Anybody? Are you completely better? Good. Anybody else completely better? Did that just happen? You were checking and staying in faith? Good. No, it's just something God's teaching us tonight. That's why I taught it this way. I felt like God wants us so much as a father to not be subject to change what we say we believe because of results or circumstances. We've been notorious for that in the body of Christ. So that just changed as you stood there, sir? That changed while you were checking and standing there and it just got better? Good. So it's completely better. Okay. Anybody else get completely better? 
Anybody else get completely better in the last few minutes as we're talking? Because you got to understand, I do this all the time. We're teaching. There's grace in the room. Things are going to keep happening. I'm just like, I'm not like, oh my gosh, where's our results? Let me see this. Who's somewhat better? Somewhat better. You just didn't raise your hand for completely better because you're not 100%. Now, that's a bunch of you there. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Okay, let's do this. This will be fun. Your person's still here, right? Your person's got to still be here. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Thank God for the increase, the results, that he's good and he did whatever he did, but thank him that he's a finished work and just tell that thing to completely leave their body. Take five seconds and do that in Jesus' name. This group that felt somewhat changed. Go ahead. Give it five, six more seconds. Speak right to it. Thank God for increase and now completely made whole in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, that's good. No, that's beautiful. You guys are amazing. No, that's, there's faith in the room. You can, you can just perceive it. Check your bodies. Who in my last group? You, you were somewhat changed, and we just prayed for you, and now you're all the way. All the way. Anybody all the way? All the way? Yeah, that time? For sure. Yeah, you look all the way right now. She's like, <laughs> she's got that all the way look. Bear with me. We're learning here. We're growing. We're learning. Who else? Anybody else all the way? All the way? Yeah? Good. Beautiful. Anybody else in my last group that was somewhat healed and they, they're, they're all the way? Who got actually better? You're just not all the way, but you're even closer to all the way. Yeah? Okay, see, now this is what I do in public. If I pray for somebody and they tell me, this has happened to me countless times. They'll say, you know, I actually feel better. I say, well, that's awesome. Let's just pray again. And they never say no. If they know they feel better, they always say yes. You pray again, and sometimes they'll go, oh, my goodness. It's like I can barely feel it now. It's like that much better. I'm not joking. It's like way better. And I'm like, no, no, I believe you. Let's just pray one more time. Here's the deal, man. Better plus better plus better is going to equal what? Come on, let's just go for it. This is God. He loves you. Boom, and then you pray. See, that's just faith, right? Hey, what, who, who's complete, who knew they were completely healed? Did, did, is that gentleman still here? Yeah, but he's got little ones he's tending to back there. What, what happened that you knew you were healed? Can you tell us? You what? Oh, yeah? So for weeks it's been really messed up. Would have been easy to know it was messed up. And you have nothing wrong at all right now. And you've been holding your little girl, feeling it out. See, now, if you've been being prayed for, thank God for that. And thank God he's doing that in you. What happened, what happened with you, kiddo? Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Left side of your head. Okay. Your left head. You had two. That's what made you sound like a two-headed woman of God. No, no, you got one mind, and it's in Christ. This is one. So, okay. I'm feeling pain on the left side of my head. Okay. Okay. So the first time it was still there, they prayed. One more time, boom, it just left. Wrist and the side of your head. Boom. Clean sweep? Beautiful. How about this young lady? What was going on? Was it your shoulder? My shoulder. Yeah? Really good. What was it like before they prayed? Was it hard to do that right there? Uh, it was definitely different. You would feel that. Like you wouldn't have just wanted to do that uh, freely because it, it would cost you. Okay. So that's gone. Yeah. Completely gone. Yeah. You feel better? Yeah. It's not 100%? Yeah. But it's, it's freer, better? Yeah. No, this is good. Check, keep checking your bodies. Don't grow weary in this. This is a little exercise that just God's teaching us faith. Is there anybody else you got completely well and completely whole and that thing changed the whole way in the last five, seven minutes since we've been talking about it? Anybody else checking your bodies for me? I want you to be totally honest. I don't want any exaggeration in the room. Anybody else checking your bodies real quick? And we're going to do one more thing and then I'll close out and we'll be done. When they told me earlier that I could go as long as I want, so. Okay, pay attention and just listen to me because this is very, very important. 
This is one we don't talk about when people pray for the sick. We rarely talk about this. I always talk about it. Who did we pray for tonight? And you've been listening. You heard a couple testimonies and you're still checking your body, but nothing's changed. It's exactly the same to you. The symptom is the same and it didn't change yet. Okay, we got a guy there back there. Is that, who's, were you praying for him? Okay, because, yeah, tell him he ain't getting a new guy. You're enough. No, you're plenty. Okay, you got your person with you here? Okay, and the lady right there, you got your person? So we got one, two, three. Anybody else? Nothing changed yet. You got your people with you? Put your hand up so they know. Okay, you're going you're gonna to pray for them. Got him? We're going to do this one more time. Now, here's very important. Pay attention. I'm, I'm doing this with all my heart and sincerity teaching because I'm seeing the difference it's making for us to learn how to stand in faith. Watch. When you pray this time, you're only praying five, six seconds, right? Watch this. It's not that you have to totally quote, but you remember what you prayed and how you prayed the first time? Watch. I don't want you to change your prayer. Don't go fishing. Don't go grabbing for straws. Don't try to add a little something or make it more powerful. It's powerful when you believe God's love through the finished work of Jesus. So whatever you prayed the first time, you speak that over. You say, why? Because we're not asking God to heal. We're telling the mountain to move. You're telling the mountain to move. And if it just sat there in the way, what do we need to do? Just tell it to move. You say, well, where did Jesus pray? Well, he prayed for a blind man. He said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees. He prayed again. He said, what do you see? He said, oh, I see men as they are. We're not asking God to heal. We're saying to the mountain, arthritis leave, shoulder be healed, knees be restored, pain you go. You get what we're doing? So let me see your hands again. This is my group that nothing changed up until now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We got at least 10, 11 of you. So I got an idea right about where you are. You all got your people with you? Okay. So what are you doing? You're believing God loves you or he did never send his son. I've been in healing service times like this where you don't teach on this stuff. And you know what people believe? They'll see a couple people get healed. And sometimes I was just in a service two weeks ago. It was a big, big place. We had no music. It was like this. It was probably 250 people standing for prayer. Uh, there were eight people. After the first round, there were eight people that nothing changed. Only eight people out of 250. Eight. We prayed for them, and I think there was two left. And we just kept, because here's what happens. When you're in that group, there's already a feeling because of what we've been taught and how we talk. And people are like, well, what's wrong with me? Or they're like, man, I thought God loved me. Well, why doesn't he love me? You said he loved me. That's why he heals me. I'm not healed. I guess he doesn't love me. And then people start going like this, and then they don't live in faith. The greatest thing you can do is believe he loves you in the face of everything. When my mother passed, he loves us. He did never send his son. My mother's in the presence of the Lord. Everybody I've prayed for, guys, I haven't seen healed in that moment, but he's a healer. And he said, if I pray believing, I'm going to see healing. I'm not changing my mind. I'm going to continue and grow up into him in all things. Does this make sense? I think we shift gears so much, we never lock in to the truth. So let's stay locked in. Tonight, pray for your person. Nothing changed up to now. Don't pray a different prayer. Pray the same prayer. And let's do it right now. If you want to pray for your person that's somewhat changed, go ahead. That's fine. You can do that. You can just believe God. But that, I definitely want my last group there. Go ahead. Pray for them right now. In Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for bringing change. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Lord. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Okay, that's my last group. It's about 10 of you or so. It might be 11. I need you to check your bodies. And let's do it this way. Just tell me. Go ahead. Check your bodies. You can all quit praying now. Just that's that's just in Jesus' name, and let's check our bodies. Check them. And this is what I want to do. Out of my last group of eleven, any of you get some change that time? Did something get better? Something change? Something loosen up? Something go away? Some change? Some or all the way? Yeah. Some. Okay. 
Anybody else somewhat changed? Anybody somewhat changed? I got one right here. She said somewhat. Somewhat? Just a little bit? Less than 50? About 35, 40%? Yeah? Okay, no, that's good though. Nothing changed up until now. And then that changed. That changed in her. Anybody else? Something changed that time. For sure? How much? About 60? 35? Okay. Somebody over here say they were getting somewhat changed? Listen, here's the point, guys. Don't get weary in this. Listen, here's the point. We prayed for these people and nothing changed. We shared a couple of testimonies, nothing changed. We prayed one more time, spoke to the mountain, and people are starting to change, little percentage here and there. What's that tell you? That tells you that faith isn't a point in time and we should continue to believe what we set out believing. Does this make sense? So one last time, please, I'm not at the risk of seeming redundant. Ch check your bodies one more time. Is there anybody else changing in my last group? Anybody? Little bit. Okay, yeah, we got that 30, 35 thing going. You know, hey, that's 30 that wasn't there, that they're saying, man, it's getting better. I don't know about you, but that's exciting. So if we prayed for you tonight, here's what I want you to do when you leave. When you leave here tonight, leave here thanking God that somebody prayed for you in faith and that he's doing a work in your body. Is that fair? The people that prayed, watch this, the people that prayed. Here's what I want you to do when you leave here. Wow, Father, thank you for the honor of praying with them. I so appreciate you and love you and thank you for your grace in them and I thank you their body's changing. And you never let go. You don't get to your car and go, man, I wonder why my person didn't change. Come on, that's what we do. I'm just being real. I've been around us for 27 years. And we're trying to get this stuff out of here so that we can continue to walk in faith. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so Father, we just thank you for what you're doing. We bless you. We appreciate you. We just honor you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Pastor? Praise God. Well, we've had, this is quite a week with healing, but I think this was really an, an amazing revelation uh, that we received tonight. Anybody enjoy Dan's uh, message here? You know, here's a, here's a funny thing. When I first met Dan, uh, there was a friend of his, uh, Dr. John, used to hand out these uh, CDs. And he, the first one he handed me was Dan's teaching on righteousness. And I lost it. And I just remember I listened to it one time driving from uh, Mechanicsburg down, down to here. I thought, where did that thing go? But I would love to hear that one again. And he knocked it out of the park tonight. How, how many of you say amen to that revelation of righteousness? Thank you, Dan. Really, thank you. You know what I mean? Because it's like one of these things where you, you, you kind of understand. This is the way it began for me. I used to always read, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. I always read that, that I had to pursue righteousness, my righteousness, not his. And that was the key. It was like, Lord, give me a better handle on his righteousness, okay? Not my behavior, what he's done. And that's where you knocked it out of the park. So give Dan a hand. This was a great word. So Father, we just thank you for all the revelations. We thank you for your goodness, Lord God, because what happened tonight was a revelation of your goodness, Lord, and we thank you so much for that, Lord. We thank you for clarity, Lord God. I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you that was released here tonight, Lord, and I pray that you would continue to lock us in, Lord, to what you have done for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we're not laying again foundations of repentance, Lord God, but we're walking in righteousness and the reality of your goodness, your love, and your power. And we bless you for what you're doing, Father. And we bless our brother Dan in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Love you, people. We'll see you in the morning.